I'm G4, and you're listening to the Beginner's Guide to Model Railroading for now, the exuberantly opinionated atlas to the basic techniques of the world's greatest hobby. This is BGT Episode 22, Scenery Part 3, Petosphere Part 2, Trees, Water, Ballast, and Details. In this episode, I'll tell you how to plant trees and wrap up the odds and ends of scenery on your model railroad. Originally, before PFP, I had alternated regular BGT episodes one-to-one -one with the Railroad History miniseries. Unfortunately, now that I'm on a monthly schedule, I find it such that the huge scope of Railroad History episodes is not something I can regularly bang out. I'll try to drop them in every now and again, and we'll continue the series through PFP even if the main sequence BGT concludes before then, but don't count on them as a regular feature. Now, some additional housekeeping relating to the last scenery episode. Firstly, I mixed up the order of baking and sifting the dirt. Sifting dirt straight out of the ground is well nigh impossible because it is usually wet and caked together. Bake your dirt in the oven first, then, once dry, sift it to remove detritus and separate different grades. Secondly, a final important step in applying static grass that comes courtesy of Chris Adams. Immediately after applying the static grass, go over the static grass field with a vacuum covered in pantyhose. This captures any stray fibers for later reuse while also offering one final pull skyward to the grass fibers statically attached to the glue, coaxing them further upright. He also personally recommends the Woodland Scenics Staticking applicator the most. Finally, also for static grass, I said that in the summer, grass has green stalks towards the bottom and tan stalks towards the top. I believe this to be inverted, but also it may vary with the species, so as always, go outside and work from the prototype. With all this out of the way, we can return to layout construction. Of all the steps to making scenery, probably the most important, visible, time-consuming, and contested is making trees. The oldest and simplest method is that of bendable armature kits. Initially made from white metal castings, now from malleable plastic, and mostly manufactured by Woodland Scenics, you make armature trees by taking a flat casting, twisting the branches into a three-dimensional shape, coating the branches with a permanently tacky glue such as hobby tack, letting it dry, then taking the same foam clump foam material used last time for bushes and mushing the clumps onto the branches one by one until the tree is sufficiently filled out. Armatures come in a variety of shapes and species, with multiple options for both deciduous and evergreens. This is an extremely simple, idiot-proof, moderately economical method, and it is even possible to zhuzh up the armatures beforehand and paint them to make realistic bark effects, but it also generally looks the worst. The same problems as before with foam clumps monotony of color and texture still apply, but are now compounded by an issue of density. Real trees are surprisingly transparent, so a good-looking model tree is one that has depth, heterogeny of branches, and at least a few narrow paths which can be squinted through. Foam clumps have all the delicate finesse of Operation Plowshare. As with bushes, this can partially be solved by using fine leaf foliage instead of ground foam clumps. But this gets very expensive very, very quickly. Other techniques are therefore advisable. The rest of the methods usually break down into two different categories, deciduous and evergreens. Starting with deciduous trees, another old and slightly more successful method involves using clumps or sheets of polyfiber, aka pillow stuffing. When this was more popular, modeling companies specifically offered green or black polyfiber products, but if you're cheap, you can use the white stuff and a can of spray paint. Also, polyfiber is sold by weight, but it's obviously not very dense, so it's easy to confuse how much you're ordering and accidentally buy enough to restuff every pillow in your house every year until you die. Ask me how I know. Keep to 1 and 5 pound boxes, if even. Anyway, start by taking a small clump of polyfiber, stretch it into a thin sheet, and on a drop cloth outside, spray it with either black or dark green spray paint. Then, while the paint is still wet, dust it with a heavy layer of ground foam. 
To actually make a tree, take the same plastic armatures as before, tear off a small portion of polyfiber sheet, and stretch and drape it over the armature, focusing where the branches are. In fact, better yet, do it only one tree limb at a time, such as to make several independent lobes of tree boughs. You can also do multiple layers to add depth and opacity. Layer the black painted polyfiber underneath the darker green polyfiber over top. Avoid using brown, as the black color better represents shadows and usually works better with layout lighting, whereas a brighter dark brown in the soft shadows of a layout room can look odd. Another modification which works well with most other techniques, but is especially successful here, is to use real branches instead of plastic armatures for your model tree trunks. The next time you have to trim a bush in your yard or want to go on a hike, bring along a set of layout nippers and a bucket, and save a few good clippings. As you cut away the timber, be like Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid and think tree. Polyfiber trees are somewhat labor-intensive, but they are a very cheap, scalable, and adaptable method for making trees, ideally suited for beginners for being easy to get into and master. A very similar and related technique usable for vast eastern forests is puffball trees. Using basically the same materials and techniques as polyfiber trees, the key difference for puffballs is that they are used to create sheets of forest canopy. Make a few polyfiber trees per normal at the edge of the forests, but as the forest rolls away and up the hillside, make and plant spheres of painted and ground foamed polyfiber. Again, the technique is similar, but in this case, grab a heftier chunk of polyfiber, roll it into a ball, spray paint it thoroughly black, and, with still wet paint, roll it through a tub of ground foam, douse it in cheap hairspray, and let dry. You may have to do multiple rounds of hairspray ground foam rolls to get enough ground foam to stick to the outer layer, but that's fine. For planting, just place a dollop of white glue where you want the tree to be, pick a puffball, and push it in place. Toothpicks can also be useful for holding trees at inconvenient angles while the glue dries. For as simple as it is in theory, you can create surprisingly vast and convincing forests with the puffball method. A hundred trees in an evening is entirely possible, and a medium-sized layout's tree requirements could be completely taken care of in two to four evenings. Just be wary of paint fumes and overspray, use a drop cloth, wear gloves, and paint and dry the puffballs outside or in the garage. There are several other methods for making deciduous trees, all probably too complicated for beginners. It's worth touching on super trees, though, for their popularity. Super trees, or similar products, utilize a popular type of weed that looks sufficiently branched at scale. They are bought in bulk, straightened by hanging whilst soaked in matte medium, then flocked with ground foam. They look extremely beautiful and realistic, but are quite time-consuming, difficult, and expensive, so I don't advise them for first-timers. Moving to evergreen trees, the basic ideas are simpler, but are all usually much more effortful. In order of increasing difficulty, yet increasing realism, the first technique is filter skewering. First, cut discs of varying diameters from filter materials, like from sponges, air filters, or anything of similar squishy, transparent make. Cut the discs into star-shaped patterns, then, using a bamboo skewer as a trunk, skewer the discs from large to small diameters, leaving small gaps between each disc. When you have something that looks vaguely tree-like, use scissors to trim the filter discs to better mismatch each other, taking care to make imperfect, ragged edges like from boughs pushing different lengths. Finally, with a tree shape achieved, as with puffballs, spray paint them black and sprinkle them with green ground foam, sealing with hairspray. Improving on filter skewers to better achieve branch definition, bottle brushing involves making your own tree-shaped bottle brushes. Take hemp twine, cut in segments, and separate the individual fibers. Take a long length of wire, fold in half, and feed the creased end into a clamp affixed to a table. Slide the twine fibers up between the wires, distribute them evenly, feed the open end of the wires into a drill mandible, and turn on the drill. The drill will twist the wires around each other, spinning the fibers in a beautiful motion, spreading the fibers like branches around each other evenly in all directions. Use wire nippers to cleave the bottle brush into tree-length sections, and use scissors to clip the fibers in a tree-like conical shape. As before, use spray paint and ground foam to end leaf the tree. These two methods are quite economical, very good at making large amounts of trees moderately quickly and quite cheaply. But if there's one thing they lack, it's a more realistic delineation between trunk and limb that is characteristic of evergreens. 
That is, in fact, a solvable problem, but as the engineer's triangle is known for vertices of cheap, fast, and good pick two, the balsa and branch method is somehow known for eschewing both cheap and fast simultaneously. Starting with the trunk, take a stick of easy-to-carve balsa wood and winnow it down to a tree-ish taper with knives. Then, use a wire brush to vigorously score the trunk and make a bark-like texture, and finally, stain the wood with a wood stain or shoe polish until it reaches the desired color. For extra credit, wash light colors into crannies and dry brush dark colors onto highlighted surfaces to attain better bark coloration. Branches, though, are a touch more difficult. Make boughs practically however you want. You can use super tree sprigs, flat twig assemblages covered in polyfiber, or even small, flat, untwisted woodland scenics deciduous or evergreen armatures. To all of these, again, spray paint and ground foam. The difficulty comes in combining the two. Using a small pin vise hand drill, drill small holes through the trunks wherever you wish to have a bow, then painstakingly feed each branch into each hole, gluing them in place, bracing them at a near right angle with spare material, and letting them dry, growing the tree branch by branch, again larger branches at the bottom, smaller at the top, until you have reached a satisfactory tree shape and branch density. To get finer control over branch angle, it may be helpful to use a pin vise to drill a smaller diameter hole up the branch, then gluing a small wire for mounting the branch into the main tree trunk. Unfortunately, all evergreen techniques are hardly easy or modular, and most are very time-consuming per tree, so it's likely best to pick one, buckle down, and devote a full several evenings to growing trees. But if you can stomach the effort, you can usually muster 10 to 20 trees or so at a time depending on the technique, so especially for a beginner layout, you can take care of all of the trees you'll need for your first layout in about eh, a month or so of effort. As far as all types of trees go, there is one final technique to note. Breaking down and buying them pre-made from a manufacturer. Nowadays, many scenery companies have extremely beautiful offerings, even down to the characteristics of an individual species. Some even offer detail packages to add your own pine cones. However, as is hopefully obvious, of all the tree-making methods, this is the most exorbitantly expensive. If you have a diorama or very petite beginner layout, this may be doable, but large layouts are fully out of the question. A middle ground technique is to utilize the higher quality professional trees for so-called hero trees, or trees that stand out for positioning or being close to the trains. Spring for the good stuff for these important, usually foreground trees, then fill in the background with the cheaper stuff. To do this, it is important to unify the foreign background trees, especially in coloration, to avoid the hero trees for sticking out too obviously as being from a completely different source. This is probably best done by giving both sets of trees a very light dusting of the same color of ground foam in order to unify the color schemes under a similar hue. And don't forget to put a nice pre-made tree into the background every now and again in order to make the tree canopy look more uniform. With all these techniques out of the way, actually planting trees is probably the easiest part of the entire ordeal. Just use a small hand drill to sink a hole slightly smaller than the trunk diameter into the layout wherever you want the tree to go, test fit the tree, fill the hole with glue, and stick the tree into the ground. If the hole is sufficiently wobbly or the hillside at an angle, you can use clothespins or other spring clamps to hold the tree upright while the glue is drying. If you have continued problems with trees tipping over, consider a fast drying glue option such as a hot glue gun. When the glue is dry, dust over it with a fresh application of dirt. Another planting note, be sure to always put the smaller trees farther back and higher up, while the larger trees should always be in the foreground. This helps to create forced perspective that the layout scenery is deeper than it actually is. Additionally, tree planting should move from back to front, since planted trees tend to obstruct your activities once they're in the ground. Relatedly, trees always tend to be much, much larger in reality than most people expect, so be sure to keep all trees next to trains and buildings no shorter than the length of a locomotive, unless of course it's a sapling. If I were to summate the entire tree growing experience, it is that practically no matter what you do, it'll be time consuming, expensive, or both. For as simple as the techniques may be, it is one of the most brute forcey aspects of modeling. Depending on where you model, you will need dozens to hundreds of trees, so you may as well bite the bullet and blow through a ton of trees in a few evenings. As far as techniques go, pretty much any technique works well enough if you put time and care into it. Try a few and pick your favorite or the one you have the most tools ready to pull off.
It's also okay to switch techniques as you move along in your modeling, but just be sure to evenly mix in the new techniques trees with the old and vice versa. Don't plant them as a monoculture such that one can look at the layout and go, ah, this is where Bill started with filter skewer trees over here, but then he moved on to bottle brush trees over there. Maybe this is best solved by keeping a healthy stock of unplanted trees that you constantly refill well before planting day, such as to keep things evenly intermixed. As with most aspects of model railroading, your work will be a constantly evolving process. If you're scared or unsure, give it a go anyway, do your best, let it sit for a few years, then rip it all out and do it again if you think you can do better. And if you're really scared or unsure, make a module. Though we've now covered the techniques of scenery which can realistically cover the vast majority of your layout, there are a few specific techniques remaining which are of particular importance, though rare. One example, while more a function of the built environment, roads are inextricably a part of the modern landscape. As always, many different and more advanced techniques, blah blah blah, but for now I'll focus on a few quick, easy, and simple beginner level workflows. First, let's start with dirt roads. Though deceptively simple, there are two pretty divergent ways to go about making one. The first, and least not undiscombobulating, is to use real dirt. There are some pretty obvious advantages, not the least of which being that it is, in fact, real dirt. Simply proceed as you would with ground cover. Pile on, spray with isopropanol or wet water, gently pipette to saturation with matte medium, and let dry. There is a bit of a difference from normal ground cover, though. Whereas before we were just providing a fine sifting to add color and texture between the plaster and grass, now you can use the dirt as effectively a sculpting medium with depth. Pile it on and bring the dirt up to make the shape of the road, sitting above the landscape to allow drainage. But be careful, the most common issue here occurs when the very thick layers of dirt are insufficiently saturated by the isopropanol and glue. When only the outer layer is wetted and matte mediumed, it creates a crusty outer layer with a soft, unsupportive interior. The slightest pressure or change in humidity could lead to the crust cracking and the loose material beneath being exposed, making a very not-to-scale sized pothole. The two solutions to this are either to excessively, extensively, exhaustively IPA and matte medium to the point that there is no way any remaining portion of the dirt could possibly be dry, or alternatively and more reasonably, to build up the dirt road in layers a bit at a time, wetting, gluing, and drying it, and then adding more dirt and repeating the cycle until the road has reached your desired profile. The second major flaw with using straight dirt for roads is that it usually misses out on the texture of actual roads. Real dirt byways are often subject to mud, wheel ruts, and grinding down of the dirt in the wagon tracks, and leaving rockier material in the median and edges of the road where the wheels don't pass. Such variety of vertical profile and material texture is often difficult to achieve with the simple sifted dirt as before, though not impossible. For the wheel ruts, buy a sacrificial vehicle and run it down the dirt road several times to make wheel ruts before gluing the dirt in place. For the varying texture, take some of your sifted dirt and sift it again through pantyhose or another sufficiently nylon-y material leaving you with a very fine dust. Then gently distribute the dust down the wheel ruts of the road, leaving the middle and edges rockier. The dust method also works well for animal tracks and human paths. Be sure to spread it on before you add any foliage because dusty weeds don't look right. An alternative method for making dirt roads which works very well especially for muddy ones is to use something called ground goop, which requires a step back to the lithosphere stage for modeling. Lou Sassy, famous model scenery maker, published long ago a recipe for making his ground goop. One parts each celluclay, vermiculite, brown latex paint, two-thirds part Elmer's glue all, a shot of Lysol liquid concentrate, and enough water to achieve an oatmeal-y consistency. I personally dislike this method as it is rather complicated, requires obscure ingredients not used elsewhere in modeling, and leads to a color that is particularly yellow-browner than is appropriate for only a few prototype places or a white carpet behind a sick dog. The color can obviously be fixed with trial and error recipeing, but why put all that effort when you could instead use real dirt from the real place, or a backyard, or a spot off your favorite hiking trail, which is already color optimized for reality. There is, however, one supreme advantage that ground goop offers over all other ground-based techniques. It is sculptable. Most lithospheric options, including the erroneously eponymous Sculptamold, are not perfectly sculptable, with most of their finesse at the resolution of grab a fistful of material and vigorously slap it on the layout. 
Even if you try to sculpt it, it's either too watery and flows too much, or it's too dry and crumples too easily, or it just sets too soon. Ground goop, on the other hand, is wet enough to have a very long working time, but viscous enough to hold most any shape you put it in. As far as roads go, you can apply it in the lithosphere stage along the route of a road, then use a narrow artist's spatula to sculpt out the road ruts or walking paths or lead up to steep buttes or building foundations or practically any aspect of layout surface scenery requiring precision. Alternatively, it can be used as the whole layout's lithosphere surface material, but I think that's a little bit more trouble than it's worth. I have not myself tried ground goop, and I may be overreacting to the unsculptability of Sculptamold, so I do encourage you to experiment for yourself, whichever method leads you to the most desirable results. I will say that Ground Goop has achieved much acceptance in the hobby, especially in the past, but it is also expensive, time consuming, and I haven't heard of many people using it recently. But, for hyper-realistic dirt roads specifically, there's really nothing better. Paved roads, on the other hand, are quite a different beast. Of the three ways I can think of as the most beginnery, the most analog is to do it yourself with styrene. Simply take a piece of sheet styrene, cut it to the width of the road, usually 10 to 11 scale feet for street lanes and 13 to 14 scale feet for highway lanes, and then score it crosswise in 3 to 4 meter sections for expansion joints. I'll talk more about scoring and cutting styrene in the next regular BGT episode on structure building. When your road is made, just like train tracks, lay a plywood or maybe foam sub roadbed, then a roadbed using the same strip cork as train track. If you're stingy, you really only need to lay the cork on the outer edges for the bevel and to strip down the middle for structural support. Apply the road in sections to the roadbed with glue, then let dry with weights on top to guarantee adherence, and later fill in the joint gaps with plastic cement or putty, paint the road with spray paint, and use gravel for the roadbed. This technique works especially well for mid-century roads which were paved concretely, had expansion joints, and were flat concrete slabs, and is probably by far the cheapest and simplest, but it does take much manual effort to get the proper, regimented geometry of many modern roads. Your arcs, cuts, and scores will need to be precise to make it look good, but if you're strapped for cash and have oodles of time, or maybe are making a one-off module with short road lengths, this may be worth considering. In much the same spirit as making a road yourself from plastic, Walther's now offers road kits in brick, concrete, and asphalt. These road kits are intensely detailed and have proper geometry in terms of road crowns, curbs, sidewalks, etc., and are basically ready-to-go plastic kits. They have pluses and minuses, an aptitude including integrated railroad grade crossings that transition from the crowned road profile to the flat profile of the railroad tracks, and a drawback including that it seems that they are wed to the 90 degree angle system and a fixed four lane width, but that is presumably fixable with a Dremel and some creative gluing. Overall, I have been very impressed with Walther's offerings in the past few years, and I would definitely consider these worth checking out if you have any sort of urban or suburban scenery. A final road-making scenery uses an old friend, plaster. This is different from the styrene or plastic methods in that it can be used as freely flowing as you wish and it may thus be more desirable for rural roads and non-city highways. For beginner purposes, it's probably best to start with a dedicated road-making kit, such as the Smooth It kit from Woodland Scenics, but it's possible to do it yourself from scratch. In brief, you outline where you want the road to go with foam tape of the appropriate depth. Mix up a batch of your old frenemy plaster, but this time mix in some cheap acrylic paints to match either the color of concrete or asphalt, whichever you're going for, then pour the plaster between the foam tape and use a putty knife to smooth it out to a nice flat surface. Let it dry overnight, gently remove the foam tape, chip away at the excess plaster outside the foam confines, and voila, a roadway. When you have your roads by plastic or plaster, you can go back and spray paint it with either an airbrush or a can of spray paint, add details such as tar patches and oil drips, and most importantly, add striping and lane demarcations with various kits ordered online. Fill out with details like road signs, parking meters, and of course cars, and a road you have now made. Another important feature of scenery which I've hitherto touched on little is water. Some railroads are fully landlocked and may not need to concern themselves with this, but nearly every railroad follows the path of least resistance, the lowest grade, the water level route through terrain. Even if you model the Granger Midwest, there's a very good chance you'll have at least one scene passing by a lake or crossing a stream. Making a water feature can broadly be broken down into two parts, preparing the scene and applying the water. 
First, to prepare the scene, you'll have to go back quite a few steps to plaster or before. If you know where the water feature will be, try your best to waterproof the area with caulk. If not, plaster it thoroughly and be sure nothing can leak from it through an unsuspecting crack. With that done, scene the river, lake, or ocean floor as you would normally, add lots of dirt, uh, silt, rocks, logs, and anything else you'd like to see underwater. Try to keep tones muted, dark, and or brown, especially farther away from the surface. If your water feature goes right up to the edge of the layout, prepare a temporary buffer dam at the edge of the layout by covering the edge with a sheet of plastic and taping it in place, then sealing with a clear caulk from inside, smoothing the caulk bead with your finger to make it as unobvious as possible. When you're satisfied with how your lake or riverbed looks, acquire for yourself a water epoxy system. There are many to choose from. Mix according to the directions, pour, and let dry. While there are many different ways to make water based on their specific recipes, there are some commonalities. For one, when pouring, it's best to pour slowly down the side of a straw or rod to limit the introduction of bubbles, and as the water is drying, go around and check for these bubbles and pop them as best you can with an old X-Acto knife or needle. More importantly, most products can only be poured and dried in very thin layers, lest the interior dry at a different rate from the exterior, leading to an extremely perverse plastic muffin cracking effect. To achieve deeper water, this means multiple subsequent layers of water epoxy must be poured and dried one after the other. Much more commonly, this means modelers choose to avoid this by simulating the effects of deeper water with painting effects onto a flat surface underneath the water, then applying just a single layer of water epoxy on top to get a glistening sheen. Basically, anywhere you can't see the bottom of a lake or river, and especially for an ocean, just use paint on a flat bottom surface and keep the scenic river or lake bed to only a narrow strip leading up to the beaches. When the water simulant is dried, it does glisten nicely, but almost too nicely, and it doesn't have enough characteristic wave effects like you'd see on actual water in real life. Many scenery manufacturers solve this too with water wave effect products, usually a gloss medium, which can be stippled onto the water surface with paintbrushes, ideally with a fan or filbert brush shape. Multiple layers of gloss medium can be added in between rounds of drying to increase wave height. Be sure to do this around things in the water which would refract waves, such as boats, piers, breakwaters, and the like. With all of this out of the way, there's one last major step to scenery, one so large and significant some of you may not have noticed it yet, but which will be obvious in retrospect. Ballast. There are many theories to ballast, but the best practice dictates that it should be the last step after the rest of the scenery is put in, because after all, the railroad came after the rocks and trees were already there. If you do your ballast first, then the dirt and grass spill over top it, and it doesn't look right. Instead, the ballast should spill downhill onto the dirt and grass. This also offers you one last chance to protect the track during the dirty work of scenery and keep it running smoothly until the very last step. For ballast color, it is rarely the stereotypical uniform gray that many people imagine. Usually mined from a convenient nearby gravel pit, ballast often reflects the local geologic landscape. Ballast in the northeast is often limestone, the southwest is tan, the Rockies are granite, and the upper Great Lakes can often be a brilliant salmony pink color due to the iron content. Ballast is also often even a heterogeneous mixture of colors that simply blends to a uniform hue when viewed from far away. Furthermore, ballast suppliers can change from railroad to railroad, with different colors of ballast changing on who owns and maintains each piece of track, even in immediate proximity to each other. Even more complexificatingly, many Midwestern lines used a sublayer of black cinders, the ashes from the bottom of a steam locomotive firebox, simply because they had that material readily available, so why pay for fresh new dirt when you could just scoop up the waste product for free at any nearby roundhouse? While I am loath to complicate things too much for beginners, the point is that it's not quite as simple as just choosing gray, and it behooves you to look up real-world photos of railroad track nearby to where you're modeling, ideally owned by the same railroad if you're prototype modeling, and pick that color of ballast. In terms of actually acquiring ballast, Woodland Scenics and Scenic Express make a variety of colors and grades, fine, medium, and coarse generally depicting N, H, O, and S or larger scale ballast respectively, made from rock mimetics like crushed up walnut shells. But Arizona Rock and Mineral is a notable company for using real dirt and gravel to precisely recreate actual railroad ballast colors, which is useful for prototype modelers. Some words of warning before we begin. 
The most critically important warning to start with is thusly. Do not, under any circumstances whatsoever, let ballast get into the inner mechanisms of a turnout. The small granules will eat away at the mechanism, freeze the turnout closed in one position, or possibly worse, prevent the turnout from fully closing in either position. This is bad in any situation, but especially so if you use power routing turnouts, which require electrical contact between the stock and point rails. This also goes for the guard rails opposite the frogs. They're usually very tightly close to the stock rail, and a grain of ballast wedged between the two can make the train cars thump riding over top it. So if you don't trust yourself, or for your first few times ballasting, use masking tape to cover the turnout throw bar and adjacent ties, both inside and outside the rails, as well as the point joint rails and guard rails. As you get better in ballasting, you won't need to be so overly cautious, but still, don't ever let ballast touch the throw bar. Another less dire note, while it may be tempting to apply glue first to make the ballast stick, don't do this as any modifications to the ballast will make it gum up and impossible to work with. Instead, keep the ballast dry for the duration of the application right up until you are completely satisfied with how it looks, and only then proceed with matte medium glue. Do not use full-strength white glue. Applying ballast is like wiring, usually regarded as displeasurable, laborious, and unglamorous, a necessary evil. Work in small sections, usually one or two tracks at a time, and no more than 20 to 30 centimeters in length. Start by pouring a small pile of ballast between the rails, and, using a small paintbrush, gently drag the pile along. Some ballast will spill over top the rails, and that's okay, we'll come back to that later. Don't push so hard as to gouge the ballast out from between the ties, but brush it enough as to remove most of the ballast from atop them. When you're satisfied, move to the edges of the track. Gently sprinkle more ballast down the outside of the ties and rail, possibly with a spoon for finer control, then repeat a similar process, gently brushing the ballast away from the tops of the ties until you're satisfied. Once you've filled in the ties, use the handle of your spreading paintbrush to gently tap atop the rails along the track to vibrate off the remaining pieces of the ballast on the ties. To finish the ballast profile, you'll now understand why the cork roadbed has a 45 degree angle bevel. Use pinches of ballast to fill in what gaps of roadbed were not covered by the ballast swept off the ties. Unless, of course, you're modeling a very cheap and dilapidated short line, the best ballasting jobs are the ones with crisp edges where the ballast meets the scenery, much like the prototype. To do this, get a foam brush with a bevel, and holding the bevel facing down, brush the ballast back up tightly against the roadbed, using the bevel to make the 45 degree angle profile. If you mess up the ballast, or if there's too much, don't worry, you can drag it sideways to the next area needing ballast, or, worst case, you can drag it down the hillside, away from the tracks, to a place where it won't be glued down and you can vacuum it up later. When all the ballast is satisfactorily placed, proceed to fix it in place in much the same way as grass and dirt, but much more gently, to avoid disturbing the beautiful profile you've created. Use a pipette or spray bottle held at arm's length away to wet the ballast with isopropanol and break surface tension. Then very gently eyedropper matte medium over the ballast. Start matte mediuming from inside the rails out, as the glue will sweep out from between the rails and down the sides of the track, speeding your job later. Start by matte mediuming atop the ties, and it will then seep into the ballast. Add enough matte medium until the ballast is visibly wet and paled. Take care not to let any matte medium onto the rails, as it will muck up electrical connectivity and be very difficult to clean later. Be especially cautious around rail joiners and turnouts. Let the ballast dry overnight, and the next day, drag your finger down the center of the rails to knock loose any stray granules, run your finger nail down the web of the rails to make sure there are no granules that could interfere with train running, and vacuum thoroughly to remove any unglued granules. Repeat this process, decimeter by decimeter, track by track, around the whole railroad, and someday your railroad will look complete. Given how unfun and labor-intensive this is, as well as how it needs to be the last step in making scenery and is the step which most endangers electrical connectivity, it is a perfectly respectable task to procrastinate. Be methodical, cautious, and deliberate. From plywood, to foam, to plaster, to dirt, to trees. I feel like we've run the gamut of modeling in this podcast over the past six years. Now I feel melancholic in wrapping up the last touches of scenery. Detailing. Wilderness scenery should be touched up with various odds and ends, like logs, rocks, and animals. 
especially at the base of any cliff, large or small, there should be a pile of talus or rockfall. Various manufacturers make such rock products, or you could sift these out from your dirt materials. Don't forget to add the odd dead tree snag standing out among the tree canopy or fallen log on the forest floor here and there. Again, these two can be commercial or natural as the opportunities present themselves. Feel free to dress these up with ground foam acting as moss. Another important detail often forgotten is straight-up weeds, especially in low-lying, wet, and boggy areas. Wherever you might find water accumulating, add a tall, growing, and stiff grass tuft. Many products are offered for such. For urban areas, possibly the easiest thing to do to bring cohesive scenic details to a model railroad is to integrate buildings into the scene. I will obviously cover structures more next time, but for now, say you have a few prefabricated buildings or you already have tried your hand at making a few, so what do you do with them? When you've decided which building is going where, if you can, mark out roughly where they're going ahead of time and bring scenery to within a few centimeters of their bases, but leave a little buffer zone. Later, when the building is ready, if the layout is permanent, affix it to the layout with a very small dollop of glue, enough that it can be easily broken later with a putty knife to recover the building undamaged. If the layout is portable, you may have to get more creative, such as by using magnetic clasps or something of the like. If you intend to detail the building's interior or add lighting, you should also go this route or do something such as using interior guide blocks to hold it in a repeatably defined position, but not permanently glue it in place. When the building is down, you can bring the scenery right up to the edge of the building, but this time use a spoon for very fine control over the application of dirt and grass. If you want, you can apply a thin layer of matte medium per normal, but don't make it as thick as usual such that if you want to remove the building later, it isn't encased in a thick crust of scenery material and it will easily pry free. The final and most important layer of scenery is to add details and figures. Many companies offer figures, often pre-painted to varying degrees of detail, but Woodland Scenics and Prizer are often very good places to start. But practically anything gracing your local hobby shop's walls that piques your interest will suffice, and several recent startup companies offer 3D printed figures and oddities, primarily mini prints. Also offered are often similar details, like street signs, trash cans, newsstands, vending machines, and other street side details. Their treatment is quite similar. To apply such details, use permanently sticky adhesive hobby tack again, here perfect for sticking and unsticking them until you're satisfied with their final location. Take your figures and detail pieces, invert them, and gently dab their underside onto the hobby tack brush until a medium small dollop of white is visible. Then dry them on their side or upside down overnight until the glue has turned transparent. The next day, firmly press the figures onto their layout, and voila, your layout has come to life. Figures are a little bit more complicated than other aspects of scenery though, technically and artistically. Whereas a rock is a rock and a tree is a tree, no matter how perfect or imperfect looking, figures aren't quite so forgiving. Sometimes figures or signs tip over, especially if their legs are tiny or they are mounted on gravelly surfaces. In such cases, you can retrofit the figure or sign with a small wire drilled and glued up the leg as a mounting pin, such that the figure can be skewered into a foam layout area or slotted into a pre-drilled section of a plastered layout area. As for the art of figures, while figures in motion would be fine for still photographs, the illusion doesn't work as well for a live layout. As best you can, choose neutral poses for figures such as to hint at life, but not give away the actual absence of it. Sitting is better than walking, parked cars are better than moving ones, figures leaning against a wall beat those in the middle of an open area, and if in the middle of an open area, those in a group huddle together beat those alone. In general, choose rest wherever you can to hide the inanimacy of everything but the trains. And you really don't need that many figures to give the effect. It goes much farther than you'd expect in promoting realism. Some final thoughts on scenery. When you can, work from photos. If you're modeling a prototype, print pictures out and tape them to your layout above your working area. Even if you're proto-freelancing or even just freelancing a real area and want the scenery to look right, either take your own photos or ones from the internet and do the same. Especially because scenery is more artistic, it can be hard to get it right, and working from real-world inspiration is very useful in the quest for realism. Real scenery is also often a very chaotic affair, so any natural products will usually always beat an artificial attempt at recreating it. Feel free to collect and dry real leaves, twigs, rocks, or basically anything from outside and see if you can make it work for your layout. A favorite is blending leaves to make forest floor ground cover. Be creative here. 
Something I haven't mentioned up to now, but which is worth noting, glycerin preserved lichen is a very old fashioned material for making trees and bushes, and in general, I would highly caution against this because it usually fades in color and smells weird with time, in addition to looking quite odd, but it may still have some uses here or there, such as for vines going up a wall, so keep it in mind for the occasional use. And finally, as always, go on many hikes. Especially if your life is a suburban one, going from house to office to grocery store, it's too easy to mistake nature for the storm runoff catchment area between the strip mall and the strode. But unless you're exclusively modeling a suburban warehouse switching railroad, this doesn't translate well to modeling scenery. Even driving through a more rural area won't cure this, as roads often carry the heavy clobbering of humankind upon the landscape, and the immediate confines of the roads in the area abutting it are often too deeply modified from their ordinary state. Instead, if you're lucky enough to live near where you're modeling, find a trail nearby where the railroad runs, or if not, in an area of similar biome as the one you plan to model, or as best you can do, and take a few hikes out into the wilderness. Observe the trees, or cacti, bushes, grasses, the shape of the hills, the hydrology, weather and how many rocks there are, note colors, textures, bring a trowel or pick up a stick, and dig a bit to see how the color of the dirt changes and how quickly as you dig into the ground. See if you can find any hillside steep enough to find a point where the grass stops growing on it. See if you can find any wetlands, and note how the vegetation changes. If you can get a high enough vantage point, overlooks are always fun, note how the forest canopy looks. Are the trees all the same species, or are they identifiably different? Are they the same height, color, are they tightly together, spread out? Observe everything you can. Once you've graduated from wilderness school, try to find a hike near a railroad, either the one that you're modeling or just really any nearby train. Now that you're familiar with how nature works, this will educate you how mankind tackles it. Note how the railroad cuts through a hill or fills a low valley in order to make the terrain more favorable. See too the lead up to tunnels and bridges. Note things like culverts, rock slide protections, and access roads. On the tinier scale, see how or if trees and weeds are controlled to keep the tracks clear. This can be turned into a fun day of rail fanning. Hack a lunch, or a book, or a few magazines, and if you have one, a scanner. Hike to a good spot for watching trains and set up camp for the day. Finally, once you've completed all of these hikes, you can do one in the built environment. Again, ideally along railroad tracks because, hey, we like trains, but the main purpose now is to see how buildings interact with nature. Note how large swaths of the ground are now leveled rectilinearly, and see how comparatively unnatural suburban turf grass monocultures are, and poke around the backside of buildings to see how they interface with the natural environment again. When you've done all of this, really nothing can stand in your way of making good scenery. As they say in urban planning circles, nothing beats a walking on it. I hope that, with this episode, I have helped you to complete bringing a degree of life to your layout after all of these years. Extra special thanks to my two newest patrons, Andrew Lavergetta and Ron Kleiss. All I asked was one dollar an episode, and wow, you guys over-delivered, especially because I, at current, offer practically zero Patreon benefits, though I am slowly adding the transcripts of past episodes for your reading pleasure. If you guys have any requests for benefits or ideas for episodes, please don't hesitate to reach out, and thank you so very much for your generosity. If you have a question or comment, would like to join these fine folks in making a donation, or would like to learn more, please visit the show's now muchly updated and simply gorgeous website at www.bgtmrring.org. That's Bravo Golf Tango, Michael Romeo Romeo Indigo November Golf. Oscar Romeo Golf. If you like the show, please give me a good review on iTunes and subscribe to the podcast feed. If you did not like the show, do not say anything and contemplate the thought crime that you have committed. This podcast was written, recorded, and produced on the ancestral lands of the Susquehannock tribe, and I would like to thank them for their historical stewardship of central Pennsylvania. And now, as your reward for listening to my closing spiel, your modeler's vocabulary word for this episode is... Ballast Scorcher. A fast engineer. Thank you very much for listening, and...